This is a Fox News alert. I'm Brett Baer in Washington. Another major setback tonight for President Obama's immigration reform agenda. A federal appeals court is refusing to lift a temporary hold on the president's plan to shield as many as 5 million illegal immigrants from deportation. Correspondent Shannon Breen is here with details. Good evening, Shannon. Hello, Brett. In a two-to-one decision this afternoon, the Fifth Circuit held that the administration cannot move forward with executive actions that would not only block millions who are in the U.S. illegally from being deported, but could also grant them access to things like driver's licenses and other government benefits. Late last year, President Obama announced a number of executive actions regarding immigration. Well, 26 states joined together to sue, and a federal judge blocked the measures just before they could take effect. The administration has been fighting to stay that ruling ever since. In today's opinion, refusing that stay, Judge Jerry Smith said the states challenging the executive action showed that allowing those actions to proceed would, quote, substantially injure them, adding, quote, a stay would enable beneficiaries to apply for driver's licenses and other benefits, and it would be difficult for the states to retract those benefits or recoup their costs even if they won on the merits. Though Texas Governor Republican Greg Abbott called the ruling a, quote, victory for the Constitution, a White House spokesperson said the judges misinterpreted both the facts and the law, adding this. The president's actions were designed to bring greater accountability to our broken immigration system, grow the economy, and keep our communities safe. They are squarely within the bounds of his authority, and they are the right thing to do for the country. It is unclear at this hour whether the administration will appeal today's ruling directly to the Supreme Court. If so, former DOJ official Tom Dupree says they're going to have an uphill battle. They're going to have to show the Supreme Court that this is sufficiently urgent, that it requires the Supreme Court to step in right now to ensure that this program goes into effect. And I don't see how they can make that showing, because what they're asking for is, in fact, a dramatic change to the status quo. A direct appeal for an emergency stay would go first to Justice Antonin Scalia simply based on geography he oversees the Fifth Circuit. He could decide alone or refer the matter to the entire Supreme Court. Meanwhile, the underlying case on the substance of the president's executive actions is also continuing. Brett. More on this with the panel. Shannon, thank you. The IRS says thieves used an online service provided by the tax agency to access information for more than 100,000 taxpayers. The data includes tax returns and other such information. The thieves hacked into the system from February until the middle of this month. The agency says it is notifying taxpayers whose information was stolen. Now to a natural disaster continuing tonight. Much of Texas is underwater right now and under an official disaster declaration. What the governor calls absolutely massive destruction has touched hundreds of homes and left about a dozen people missing in the floods fueled by torrential rains. Reporter Hillary Whittier from our affiliate Fox 26 in Houston is live for us tonight. Hi, Hillary. Hi, Brett. Well, things actually have gotten a little bit better. In fact, I'm holding on to this pipeline right here in this bayou. This was completely underwater just hours ago. Things are starting to look up, but still, if you see behind me, quite aggressive water out here in southwest Houston and all over the city. Still, quite a bit of it is underwater. We've seen thousands of cars just totally abandoned, broken down. Not much you can do when the cars are just underwater and they're and you're hurting to find a way out. Well, we know a lot of people have been trapped. We've already had federal uh, authorities tell us that several people have died because of this flash flooding. Now, this is historical in our books. We haven't seen anything like this since about 2001 when we saw Allison come through our area. We also know that the fire department has responded to about 500 emergency rescue calls overnight. Now, in the past 24 hours, we've seen eight inches of rain in the area, about 80,000 power outages. So we are starting to see things look a little bit better from this time yesterday. We aren't seeing as much rain. The skies are starting to open, but we are expecting more rain tonight. So obviously still a lot to hopefully gear up for. People will be okay on the roadways, and we're starting to see people pass on the roads that were not passable before. But if you look behind me still, the water, aggressive, scary. You want to stay off the roadways. And like you said, Governor Abbott did issue a warning 
to about 24 Texas counties because this is such a dangerous territory area that we are facing right now. Hopefully things will start getting better soon. We're live in Houston. I'm Hillary Whittier. Back to you guys in D.C. Hillary, thank you very much. Hope for some dry weather your way. From a natural disaster to a man-made one, the chaos in Iraq. Iraqi troops and militias have launched a counteroffensive against ISIS terrorists in Anbar province. But the Pentagon says this new operation has barely begun. This comes amid ongoing complaints over the U.S. role in the fighting. We have Fox team coverage. Kevin Corks at the White House, where President Obama met today with the Secretary General of NATO. But we begin with National Security Correspondent Jennifer Griffin at the Pentagon with what's happening on the ground. Hi, Jennifer. Good evening, Brett. No sooner had the Iraqis announced the counteroffensive to retake Ramadi had begun, saying they had surrounded the city on three sides, then the Pentagon pushed back, saying all it has seen are some shaping operations, artillery and rocketing, but not a full-scale ground assault. Just days after the fall of Ramadi, Shia militias known as the Popular Mobilization Committees, backed by Iran, prepared to lead the fight to retake the capital of Ambar province from ISIS. In the wake of Defense Secretary Ash Carter's unexpected and blunt assessment of the Iraqi military and why Ramadi fell. In fact, they vastly outnumbered the opposing force, and yet they failed to fight. They withdrew from the site, and uh, that uh, says, uh, to me, and I think to most of us, that we have an issue with the will of the Iraqis to fight ISIL and defend themselves. The State Department tried to downplay differences with the Iraqi government. I think the Iraqi authorities themselves have acknowledged uh, that, that there were breakdowns in, in military command, planning and reinforcement. And Vice President Joe Biden had to back clean up this weekend. In a hastily arranged phone call to the Iraqi Prime Minister, Biden thanked him for the enormous sacrifice and bravery of Iraqi forces. And the State Department rushed a shipment of 2,000 AT-4 anti-tank weapons to Baghdad. General Stan McChrystal led the counterterrorism fight in Ambar province during the surge. New weapons are not going to make the difference. If war was math, everybody would add up who has the most and then you wouldn't fight because you'd know who'd win and lose, but it doesn't happen that way. The Pentagon is concerned about the new name given to the Ramadi operation, a battle cry that may anger the Sunnis that they are supposed to be helping. The operation is named for the battle that launched the schism between Sunnis and Shias in the 7th century. At 5 o'clock this morning, a convoy of heroes departed while singing the poems of heroes and victories to announce the start of the Labak Ha Hussein operation through the barrels of their rifles. A massive sandstorm engulfed Iraq's Anbar province today. Confusion over whether the U.S. Air Force could drop bombs in a sandstorm when Ramadi was falling was one factor causing many frontline Iraqi troops to flee. Brett? Jennifer Griffin, live at the Pentagon. Jennifer, thank you. Now to the politics of Iraq and President Obama's bid to get as much possible buy-in from allies for his Iraq strategy. Correspondent Kevin Cork is at the White House tonight. In welcoming to the White House, Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg, President Obama called NATO the strongest alliance the world had ever seen, noting all 28 members are part of the coalition to support the Iraqi government in its fight against ISIS. We are working closely with NATO allies to make sure that we are partnering with other countries uh, to address issues of counterterrorism, making sure that uh, uh, we continue to coordinate effectively in the fight against ISIL. The Oval Office visit was in stark contrast to Stoltenberg's last trip to Washington in March, when, despite apparent scheduling availability, the president didn't make time to meet with the NATO chief, though he did meet with Secretary of Defense Ash Carter. Some called it a snub. By any definition, the decision was puzzling, given the range of issues the men could have discussed. The drawdown in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, to say nothing of Russian aggression in Crimea and eastern Ukraine. The the latter of which was a focal point of Stoltenberg's visit today. The United States is together with NATO providing strong political support for Ukraine, uh, for the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of Ukraine, but also practical uh, support. And we do that to try to help the Ukrainians uh, increase their ability to defend themselves. And it's that notion to help countries defend themselves that's the centerpiece of the Obama foreign policy. The idea? Support by providing assistance, but avoid costly entanglements. I guess one thing that is true in Iraq that is also true in Ukraine is that the United States is standing by our Ukrainian partners 
uh, as they try to confront this threat to their own security. The president's position has critics both here at home and abroad. Even in Iran, where a general leading that country's counterterror effort in Iraq suggested the U.S. wasn't actually committed to defeating ISIS. The Tasnim News Agency cited Major General Qasem Soleimani as saying, quote, Today in the fight against this dangerous phenomenon, nobody is present except Iran. Tomorrow, the Secretary General Brett is expected to meet with Secretary of State John Kerry and National Security Advisor Ambassador Susan Rice. Among the many topics they're expected to go over, increasing contributions by member nations to the alliance, both financially and militarily. Kevin Cork live in the North Lawn. Kevin, thank you. Up next, the Republican presidential field is about to expand again. First years of some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox 42 in Omaha, Nebraska, where law enforcement from all over the country turned out for the funeral of Officer Kerry Orozco. The new mom was killed last week in a shootout one day before her maternity leave was scheduled to begin. Fox 5 in New York, with a follow-up to yesterday's threats called in against several passenger jets, as many as six planes were checked out on the ground. Law enforcement officials tell Fox 5 they were concerned about a possible plot to disrupt and delay air travel in the New York area. And this is a live look at Philadelphia from our affiliate Fox 29. The big story there tonight, Amtrak says it will install video cameras inside locomotive cabs to record the actions of train engineers. The announcement comes following this month's derailment in Philadelphia that left eight people dead and about 200 injured. The engineer in that accident says he cannot remember what happened. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back.